that young lady that's playing the piano can do something that you can't do? Did you notice that? She can sing. She can sing. <laughs> now, I don't mean that disparagingly because Clarence can make a joyful noise unto the Lord. He does it every time we pull in a restaurant. <laughs> Yippee, Lord. <laughs> That's not true. That's what I do. I love to eat. I love to cook. You like you have things you like to do and then you indulge in the things that you do. And my wife says, I don't know how you've lived to be as old as you are the way you eat. Because if it's not run through pig fat, I'm not sure you've cooked it. You know what I'm saying? And she's just the opposite. I wish she could be here this week so you could see her. And, uh, and I would be able to say to you in front of her, she's the one with high cholesterol. <laughs> she has high cholesterol and I don't. And my, her doctor asked me one day, he said, Reverend, uh, and, and I always get tickled when people who don't know me, but no, I'm a preacher, call me Reverend. And he said, Reverend, I would like, well, what does your diet consist of? Because uh, she had told him that my cholesterol is good and she has to take a cholesterol pill and her thyroid's bad and she would kill me for telling you all of her health problems. <clears throat> and I said, oh, doc, you don't even want to know because it would destroy everything you've learned in your medical manuals. <laughs> Oh my, I tell you, I have enjoyed the blessing of being with you folks. I do revivals in churches all over the place. And I tell you, I know a friendly, godly church when I see it. Now, I know you're not perfect and you don't have to, you, know, you don't have to explain to me that you're not. Oh, preacher, we got our problems. Don't we all? Amen. I'm not perfect either. And if you think, oh, that brother Frank, he's so wonderful. If my wife was here, she'd just blink her eyes at you <laughs> and say, you have lost your mind. But it's wonderful to be with God's people and see you enjoy God's word, the singing of God's word coming together. You've had wonderful attendance all week. I thank you for that. I thank you for I can I can look in your eyes when I'm preaching. And I can see those faces and I can see you're engaged and you're listening. And so I'm very grateful for that. As I told you before, I'm not an entertainer and I'm only an average preacher. But God has blessed me to be able to pastor Southern Baptist churches all of my life. I started in 1975 and I quit uh, full time pastoring ministry in uh, the year of COVID. That will be. That will be my, on my mantor from now on. I quit in COVID and my associate who became the pastor could not have thanked me more. I quit in January and in March, everything went crazy. And uh, I look at him and I said, you got to know when to get out. That's all I tell you. <laughs> so we blame him at Union Hill. We blame him for most of all of that, that, you know, God's uh, punishment on us was that. But uh, I'm grateful for God's people. I've had wonderful churches. I've had wonderful congregations. I don't have any idea how many weddings I've done, how many funerals I've done, how many baptisms. I've done. I didn't keep track of all that stuff. That's not, that was not important to me. But I can tell you that when I see those people who I have somehow influenced their lives, Little children come up and hug me by the legs and say, oh, Brother Frank, we love you. And they have no reason to love me. They only love me because they chose to love me. That's it. And that's the way most of God's people is, is you have chosen to love someone who brought to you the word of God that you knew was the truth. Authority's not in me, it's in him. Isn't that wonderful? This week, we've been talking about how do we know what God's will is for our life. There's no greater question for the Christian to ask than God, what's your will for my life? Every phase, every step of life brings that same question. I've been praying for Tim this week back here because he's going to go through shoulder surgery. I've had two knee replacements. I've had four vertebrae in my back worked on. They want to work on those four again and they have four in my neck they want to work on. And I've told them, no, 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 I think I'm going to die broken. <laughs> I'm going to wait. I'm going to hold out until I can't take it no more. But I've prayed for him this week. I didn't know him before this week. I met him this week. 
But God put a prayer need in my life that I will be able to pray for. And Tim, I promise you, after I'm long gone and you have forgotten me because you're worrying about the little therapist that's going to work on your shoulder, I will call Brother Danny and say, tell me how Tim's doing. Because you see, we make those connections in our lives and they become important forever. Uh, somebody says Elkton Baptist Church from now on. Why, two months ago, I didn't even know you existed. Four days ago, I'd never been here. And yet today, now, I have these all of these wonderful memories that God has put in my mind to strengthen me, to encourage me, to lift me up. So when I leave here, you're going to go with me. I'm going to... I'm going to show the picture of your choir to a whole bunch of little churches who say we can't. And I'll say, oh, yes, you can. <laughs> and I have proof. Tonight, we're going to talk about this life. Remember last night we talked about we ha it has to be by faith. We have to put our faith. Today, even at our ages, we have to walk by faith. The Bible says the just in Romans chapter 1, the just shall live by faith. Faith in what? Talked about that last night. Faith in Jesus Christ, that new covenant that comes. Tonight I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 3. And tonight we're going to talk about, okay, now that I've put my faith in Him, this life is not my own. It's no longer mine. We touched on it last night a little bit, that it belongs to the Lord. But there are some things that we have to give up ownership of okay things that in our minds we have to give up ownership of now i played baseball i went to obu uh in 76 i, I went to hannibal grange for a half a semester and uh while they redshirted me at, at OBU, and then I went and played baseball at OBU under scholarship, and I was very grateful that I got to play. I was not, I wasn't all that great. They were terrible. So because they were terrible, they wanted a mediocre player like me. And I got to play and get my college paid for. And I was a preacher on a baseball staff. And you can imagine how that goes, even in a, in a Christian Baptist school. But it was where God had placed me for a period of time that allowed me to grow. And as I grew in college, I had already pastored churches. Most of my fellow students had never pastored a church. And so when I had professors that taught me things that I wasn't sure I agreed with, uh, I, I'd want to question them because I maybe had preached in the opposite direction those things. Well, was I preaching that wrong or how did I misunderstand this? And uh, it caused me to, to begin to realize that an opposite view doesn't have to be destructive. An opposite view can actually strengthen your view. Because if you recognize as the authority of your life the Word of God, if it doesn't match up with this, Danny, for me, there's something wrong with it. You know, if it doesn't match up here, why doesn't it match up here? If it doesn't match up with the life of Jesus, it doesn't match up with the nature of God, and it doesn't match up with the Bible, then I've got some, as Zig Ziglar says, some stinking thinking going on. I've got to change that stinking thinking because I believe that the truth will match up with God's divine will. It'll match up with Jesus and the example that he lived in his life. And the word of God will undergird it and support it. And then on top of that, the Holy Spirit is going to prompt me that same direction. Now, it's easy to get a wrong idea. A lot of people think the Bible contradicts itself. I don't think it does. I think we just don't understand it. We're not sure what he's talking about. But in Galatians 3, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Galatians 2. In Galatians 2, there is no question. He makes it clear. Paul writes this uh, letter to the church of Galatia. And I want to begin in verse 16. And your Bible, if you're reading out of a Schofield or a Thompson chain reference, is probably the heading is going to say justification by faith. 
Now, you remember those three things, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification is the point of salvation, where I'm justified before God, my sins are forgiven. I don't do that. Jesus does that. Sanctification is the setting apart. Remember, we talked about the communion table last night being sanctified. I'm in the sanctification stage now. I'm being set apart. I'm working out my salvation, all of those things. Sanctification is a process. Glorification happens whenever I die and I go to heaven. I get to see Jesus. That's the glorification. Then he wipes away every tear. All sorrow is ended. Uh, I'm, I'm saved and now in the glorified state. Now listen to me. You're no more saved when you get to heaven than you are right now. You're just as saved today as you're ever going to be saved. You're just in a different phase of life. And you have to walk through that phase. My mother, my grandmother and grandfather lived in Payson, Illinois. I don't know if any of you know where that is. Payson has a square, and in the middle of the square is a water tower. And when I was a little boy, I was the youngest of the cousins. They left me on top of that water tower in a diaper and a t-shirt because I'd followed my cousins. They tell me that my grandmother asked the other boys, where's Frankie? And uh, one of my cousins said, last time we saw him, he was on top of the water tower. <laughs> well, you can imagine my grandmother. Now, I, I don't remember any of this story, but I only have heard it from aunts and uncles whose reputations are somewhat soiled, you know. And uh, they said grandmother ran out the door and told those grand boys, every one of you get on the top of that water tower and do everything you can to make sure that baby is safe. And so they went up and got me and brought me down. Uh, grandmother lived in that house after my grandfather had died. I was only a year old. He had a stroke in the front yard. His name was Frank. That's who I was named after. And he died there. And at grandmother's house, upstairs, if you walked around the house, it just looked like a normal house. But in her bedroom was a door. And it was nailed shut. You, you could tell it was nailed shut. And when someone, a grandchild, would ask her about that door, here's what she'd say. Oh, you don't want to open that door. You do not want to go through that door. Trust me, leave that door shut. Well, that made kids' minds go crazy, right? What's on the other side of that door? And we were horrified. We thought monsters were going to eat us. You know, we had all kinds of things. And I grew up with my grandmother's house with this do mysterious door that was there. And what was on the other side of it? And what was through it? And I wouldn't touch it. I had cousins wouldn't even go in that room because of that door. Well, my grandmother got ill, moved in with my aunt, and I'm much older. I'm in junior high school by now. And my dad go out to the, out to the whole home place, and we're going to clean up some brush around the house and get ready to sell it. And I'm out there cleaning brush away from the house. And I look up, and I see this door up on the side of the house. And I said, Dad, what's this door go to? And he said, well, there used to be a porch go up this side of the house, and you could go in the upstairs bedroom this way in case you wanted to rent that bedroom out. You could get up there. But he said, the porch got old and popped toward off, and he nailed the door shut <laughs> and kept the door closed. And all the lights came on. <laughs> and old genius Frankie figured out what was on the other side of that door? I ran upstairs. I took a hammer. I pried away all the nails. And I opened the door. And I looked out from the second story out over Payson, Illinois. And it was absolutely beautiful. Friends, that's what I think my picture of death is. I got this horrible idea because I don't know what's on the other side of the door. And I have a feeling when I walk through it, I'm going to go, well, for crying out loud. <laughs> Why was I afraid of this? Jesus is here. Look at this place. And that illustration tells me of the hope that my faith has for me. My hope 
is in nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Man, if this story in this word of God is not true, then it, it doesn't matter what we believe, right? It doesn't matter what we believe. But if it is true, and I believe it is, then everything that we believe matters. When I talk to atheists, I always tell them, let me tell you something, and I draw a circle in the ground or on a piece of paper. Suppose everything that you could possibly know, man could possibly understand, is inside this circle. And they'll say, okay. Is it not possible that there's something outside of this circle that you don't know anything about? And if they're using their intellect and their logic, they're going to say, well, yes, I suppose. Well, I want to tell you about this that's out here. And by the way, if, you're, if I'm wrong and you're right, this hadn't cost me a thing. But if you're wrong and I'm right, it's cost you everything. Friends, I'm telling you, I don't believe in God by chance. I believe in God because I've put my faith in the Word of God, in connection with the Spirit of God, by the illustration of the Lord Jesus, our God. That's where my faith is. Paul says this, listen, chapter 2 and verse 16. Read along with me if you want to. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified. The reason we believe is that we'll be saved. Amen? That's the reason we believe. So that we'll be saved. Justified by faith uh, of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We're not going to be saved by our works. Dwight L. Moody, the great pastor of uh, you know, Moody Church, said that if salvation was possible by swimming the Mississippi from its port to its mouth, there would be people drowning every day. But because it's free and by faith, there are people going to hell every day. Friends, we cannot get our brains wrapped around why a loving, gracious, perfect God would sacrifice His loving, gracious, eternal, perfect Son for someone that is imperfect, that has sinned by nature. As a matter of fact, the world will say, how, why did God even create that? Well, let me tell you why. Why did God create sin? So that we could demonstrate our love to Him. I, I had a shirt I started to wear it. I brought it with me and chickened out. It's a t-shirt. And it, what the t-shirt says, I was going to wear it over my shirt, you know, nice collar and all that. What it says is, world's greatest number one dad. White, big blue letters, obnoxious as it can be. My children got it for me. <laughs> now, if I'd have gone out and bought that shirt, it wouldn't have meant beans. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But because my kids gave it to me, it's my price. I, I don't even wear it outside because I don't want something to happen to it. You know, I, I want to keep it. And uh, I, I told my wife, if you're going to bury me and want to bury me in something, bury me in that T-shirt. <laughs> World's greatest dad. Man, there's nothing I'm more proud of than that. And the only thing that's making me prouder, and by the way, pray for my family. Wednesday at noon, my two grandchildren that are foster grandchildren have a Zoom meeting with the judge, and they will be declared our children Amen. on Wednesday. That's Wednesday. So you pray for that. And those kids love me and think, you know, I can do anything. They, they just think pop is the greatest thing in the world. And that's not a bad goal. But listen to me. Our faith in Jesus is because of how great he is. How great is he? To overcome all of sin. To overcome, he's not under the circumstances. He's on top of the circumstances. Everything is under him. 
it, it, he said this. He's so powerful. This is what he said. If I be lifted up, I will draw Amen. all. Little Greek lesson. The word all, you know what it means in the Greek? All. Oh. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. I don't believe you go to hell on accident. I don't believe you just slip up and go. I believe the Bible says the unpardonable sin is that I reject what the Holy Spirit has drawn me to. I believe everybody is drawn, whether it's by nature, the pygmies in Africa, seeing the stars and the suns and the moon and all that stuff, or whether we hear the gospel story. If we reject it, that's what happened. For him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Listen, Jesus loved us so much that he came out of heaven and considered it loss to do the will of the Father. Uh, uh, let me tell you something. This will be a little hard preaching for some of you, but like I said, I'm gone in two days. You don't have to listen to it anymore. Jesus didn't go to the cross because he loved us. I mean, he did because he's God, right? And it says God so loved the world. So he did. But you know why he went to the cross? Obedience to the Father. Amen. The rock. He told us, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And God said, it ain't possible. And Jesus says, then I love God enough that I'm going to be obedient to him. And I'm going to go to the cross. He suffered for us because he demonstrated to us how much we should love our father. How much we should love. It's not my life. It wasn't Jesus' life. And because of his obedience, I'm going to have a fit here in a minute. Because of his obedience, God said, I'm going to elevate your name above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess Amen. that he is Lord. Now, I believe every tongue means every tongue. I've cleaned chickens. They have a tongue. Did you know that? I believe that every chicken, every animal, every dog, every cat, everything that has a tongue is going to cry out, Jesus is Lord. Now, you don't have to believe. You say, preach that silly. I don't believe that. Well, you can't prove me wrong. <laughs> Bible says every tongue. Greek word for every, huh? Every, yeah. I just believe the simplicity of God's word. And if you can't prove me wrong, then you can't match up. This trumps everything. God's word trumps everything for me. So when he says here in Galatians, hey, that for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, that means my works are but filthy rags before him. Now, I think we should do good works. But listen, good works <clears throat> is not the stuff that gets us to heaven, nor is it the stuff that puts some merit to us. Our good works is the outpouring of a righteous heart. Whenever we have our heart right, we're going to do good things. You know why? Because that's who God is. God is good. And because of his nature, he outpours good things. It rains on the just and the unjust. It's not my will that any should perish. There is no other name under heaven whereby man shall be saved. God pours out his goodness to everybody. Some just reject it. And if they reject it, well, that's too bad. But the Bible says narrow is the way and few there be that will go in it. Now, we don't narrow it up. Let him narrow it up. Right? I want to be as seeker friendly as I can be without setting the word of God aside. I want to encourage anyone. Homosexuals come to my church. They're welcome. But I tell them I'm preaching God's word homosexuality is sin, that's not hard to see. Now, before you send me an email or say something ugly to me, I got family members too that are homosexual that every Christmas, Thanksgiving, every time we get together, we'll say, Frank, 
Have you got them Southern Baptists straightened out yet? And I'll say, yeah, I think so. I think they're right on the mark. <laughs> I mean, I'm there. I'm with you. But sin is sin. We don't have to question God's word. An abomination is an abomination. Amen? Amen. That don't sound good to me, does it you? I don't want to be an abomination to God. And so when he calls it sin, it's sin. It's like people come to me and say, Brother Frank, you think it's wrong to have a drink? Well, that's not the question. The question is, what does God say? And here's what God says. It's foolish. Now, I don't know how you were raised, but here's how I was raised. Hey, Dad, me and the boys are going to go down to the river, and we're going to hang out. We're going to be back about midnight, and we're just going to hang out at the river. We're going to build us a fire down there at the river, and we're not going to do anything bad. We're not going to do anything that we shouldn't do. Dad, we're just going to be down there. What do you think? Well, Frank, I think that's foolish. <laughs> that never sounded like yes to me. That, hey, sure, it's okay. That never sounded like yes. Now, there may not be anything wrong with having one drink. I, I don't have any idea what your conviction is. I ain't having one. But if you want to have one and you think it's okay, that's fine. I, I, I know drunkenness is wrong every time. Amen? And I know it can damage your testimony. Even one glass of wine in a restaurant with your wife on your anniversary and some little fourth grader from Sunday school class walks through the restaurant with mom and daddy because they're at the Olive Garden and they see you and she reaches up to me and says, Daddy, how come Jason's drinking wine? And I lean down to her, being the jerk that I am, and I said, I don't know, baby. Why don't you go over and ask him? <laughs> I did that with Cameron in Olive Garden in Columbia, Missouri. I, I don't have any idea what you believe. But as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. I don't have to give an answer for my brethren. But I do have to give an answer for the example that I live and the example that I set. And if I cause a little one to stumble... Now, you've got to stretch your imagination here, but when I'm with Clarence and he's with me, we're two little ones of God. And we have to be careful that we don't cause each other to stumble. I'm with Brother Danny. He's pretty hard on me. Have you noticed how hard he is on me? I'm hoping he confesses when I'm gone. <laughs> we're two little ones from God. And so... We have to be careful that we don't offend one another and cause one another to stumble. You see, God is love and he wants the love to be demonstrated how we treat one another. How we respond with him. And just because I don't agree with you is no reason for me not to love you and care for you. And so it's not my responsibility to check off who's naughty and nice. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And believe me, he can do it a lot better than I can. And so here's what he says. Our works aren't going to save us. Look at verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified in Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Well, he's talking about our choices, isn't he? God forbid. It's not that Christ is the minister of sin. It's that I've chosen to act irresponsibly with the faith that he has given me. Can you agree with that? My sin, I'm accountable for my own sin. James 4, 17. For him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him is his sin. So it's no longer me, but Christ who lives in me. We're going to get there in a minute, aren't we? So when I'm dipped in the water, buried with him in death, raised to walk in newness of life, the picture is Frank Whitney has died, surrendered his life, and he's buried in Christ. Now he's raised to walk a new creature in Christ. Not the old creature, but a new creature. 
Now, his car payments still do. He still has children to raise. He still has all the obligations that are his. But now he must do it from the aspect of a Christian. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I was in business for myself for many years. I was a wholesaler for Dayton Tire and Rubber Company for many years. I had a satellite company. I've done a number of things along with pastoring, things that allowed me to pastor. <laughs> and when I was in business, I discovered there were lots of times when I had to make a choice. Am I going to be a godly businessman doing things correctly? Or am I not going to be? And friends, sometimes it costs me money. Man, it, it, I thought, this is good. This is not going to be good. It's going to break me. This is a, one of my biggest client. And I'm not going to buy him alcohol and take him out to eat and pay for his liquor bill. I'm just not going to do that. And if it costs me, then God, you're just going to have to take care of me. That's the faith part. That's the faith walk. There's no, I don't get a star because I did the right thing. I'm a new creature in Christ. I get a star when I'm raised out of that water, a child of his. I'm no longer the pauper's son. I'm a child of the king. And that's the glory that God gives to us. Amen. Now listen, we're all set in our ways. I can tell by looking at this crowd. Some of you are going to be pretty fussy. If my dog walks in your yard, right? what's that dog doing in our yard? My wife says, you're beginning to sound like every grouchy old man in the neighborhood. And what, hey, well, what's going on there? What are they doing out there? Like, you know, I've got some kind of authority. <laughs> Power company tell me, shut up and get out of our way. <laughs> but we, we forget that our authority lies in Jesus. And as pastors, uh, sometimes we really forget that. We, we really forget that, hey, we're servants. We're not CEOs. John Piper wrote a great book, Brethren, We Are Not Professionals. We are servants of the cross. Trustees, elders, finance people, deacons, all these. We got to be careful that we don't forget who's in charge. Mm hmm we we got to be careful that we remember we're under the blood by the faith and the grace of the Lord Jesus. And that's how we have power. That's how we have authority, not among one another. Well, well we shouldn't worry about who has the power here. I want to know who has the power to go out there and win somebody to Jesus. That's the power that we want to possess. And so Paul writes to this church in Galatia and he says, listen, if you go back to sinning, go back into those things, don't you claim that God is a minister of this? For if I build again, verse 18, the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. In other words, I've asked forgiveness of those things. I've been forgiven to them and now I go back to them. That makes me a transgressor of my forgiveness. Hebrews tells it a little different way. And that is that if you have once tasted of the heavenly gift, to lose it, to gain it back, you'd have to put Christ to an open chain. And so if you do lose it, you can't ever get it back because you've made a transgressor of the law. So church, the only way you and I can be in a right relationship with God is every day, Every night, every morning, every whenever, we come before God and we justify ourselves through forgiveness, His mercy, His grace, and we simply say to Him, God, forgive me for the transgressions of this day. Now, I don't know about you, but when I started this practice in my own life, I had a yellow pad next to my bed. I was a very young man. And I began to write down when I'd go to bed. That's where my prayer time is when I go to bed. And I would write down every sin that would, I could consciously remember that day. And when I got them all wrote down, I began to pray and I'd ask God to forgive me of them. Pentecostals use the term I love. They call it being prayed up. I'm all prayed up. Paul said it this way. 
die daily. Surrender your life daily. And so all my life, this has been the practice of my life. God, forgive me. Last night when I laid my head down on the pillow in the hotel room, I said, God, if I offended anybody, Lord, I pray that you forgive me for the offense. And tonight when I lay down my head on that pillow, I'll say, Lord, if I said something to offend somebody tonight, God, forgive me of that offense. For I don't intend to do anything but lift up the name of Jesus. But even when he had the best of intentions, we are still men with feet of clay. We still make errors. We still make poor judgments. We still say things too quick and we wish we could reel it back in. But James tells us we can't. That tongue is a powerful thing. And we have to be careful. Have to be careful with our ears what we hear. Sometimes we interpret what people say and it's not true. How many of you have women have ever looked at your husband when you've asked him to do something and he didn't move and then he said, are you mad? And you said, no, I'm fine. <laughs> I'll tell you, Danny, I know a little brunette that when she says that, it ain't fine. We're, we're in trouble. We all hear things that we want to hear that sometimes causes us to make decisions we shouldn't make and say things that we shouldn't say. And those are the places that we have to confess, not only to our fellow man, but to God. God, I don't want to be that guy. God, I want to be seen as the gracious, loving, uh, godly man that you want me to be. God, help me to be that man. And I know... Clarence got much scratch his head and say, oh, Frank, if you knew how hard that was. To help us to grow, to be, to consciously make the choice that, hey, I'm going to live differently. That's the surrendered life. This life is not my own. I do not have the right to say, God, it's my money. Man, if God ever played that game with you, you wouldn't like it very much. He'll say, my air, all of a sudden you can't breathe. Right? It's not our life. We live under the power and the authority of God's grace. And by faith, we've asked him to receive us as a sinful, wretched sinner. And he said, okay. And by his grace, we are his children. Paul says you can't go back. You can't quit. For through the law, I am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Today, I'm obedient to the law because I love God. When I was a boy, that seven, that seven year old burr headed toothless boy I was telling you about, he came to know Jesus because he didn't want to go to hell. I didn't want to go to hell. I wanted to go live with Jesus. I didn't want to go to hell. And so I was saved, seven-year-old faith, not, I don't want to go to hell. What do I have to do not to go to hell? We've got to trust in Jesus. Well, I love Jesus. Yes, but you've got to confess your sins, ask him to come into your heart. I did all that. Then, because I didn't want to go to hell. I'm not a Christian today because I don't want to go to hell. Now, I still don't want to go to hell. Don't get me wrong. But I'm a Christian today. Even if heaven wasn't promised to me, even if I just died and rotted away like an old shoe, I'd still be a Christian. Because I love this life. I love the way to respect people, the way to love on people, the way to give hope, the way to encourage, to see people's lives come into alive, to see a lost world come and what was once despair and darkness all of a sudden to be hope and joy and light. And to realize that there's a promise of eternity. Oh, the reason that I'm a Christian today is because the revelation of Jesus in my life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that draws me to him. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Friends, today as Christians, we should still be being drawn to the cross we should still be being drawn to the holiness of God. We should still be being drawn 
to helping this lost world come to know him. And Paul says, I am crucified. Look at verse 20. We're closing. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ living in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Friends, today our life is not our own. And we have to be willing to say, yes, I'm a child of God. <clears throat> and so today, Lord, what would you have me do? Today, Lord, give me the job that's mine. When I was a child growing up, my dad was king. We did not live in a democracy. <laughs> I mean, what, what he said, that's what went. And the stupidest question you could possibly ask him was, why? Frank, I want you to do this today. Okay, why? You don't need to know why. I told you I want you to do this. You see, the first step in my father's mentality of child rearing was the first step is straight obedience. That, that kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? You just learn to be obedient. Then as I got older, the why was acceptable. Unless, of course, he knew I was questioning his authority, then the why was unacceptable. Because, you see, he was the authority. Because my father taught me that, it's been easy for me to understand when God says, why? Because I said why. My book says why. Mm -hmm. When we don't teach our children the authority at home, how do we expect them to believe that God's going to do what he says he's going to do? Mm -hmm. My daughter heard my grandson say to my wife, she said, why did you get in trouble with Pop, Walker? And he said, I told Pop no. And my daughter gasped out loud. She's 36. She gasped. She said, Walker, you don't tell Pop no. You don't tell Pop no. I don't live in a democracy at my house. When you come through those doors, you're out of the democracy. You're now in a monarchy. <laughs> and there's a king and a queen. You got it? <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Yeah, there's a king and a queen. What they say goes. And so my son will say, listen, they've had enough sugar. And I'd say, why don't you go in the other room for a minute? <laughs> because you see, they're in this world of domain. Folks, when we say, I'm going to follow Jesus, we surrender our life, raised to walk in newness of life under the rule of King Jesus and his word. And the only way we can find real joy, the peace that passes understanding, is by following His Word. Amen. And when we do, He says that we will know riches untold, blessings beyond blessings, Amen. happiness beyond happiness. Amen. The little widow closed with this story. The little widow who came into the temple and all she had was a little pittance of money. And she threw it in the, in the offering box. She gave all that she had. You think she did that because she had to? Because somebody made her? Or because somebody knew how much she had? No, sir. She did that because she had sold out every ounce of ebbing strength she had to the Lord Jesus or to the Heavenly Father. And Jesus said, of all these that have given, she has given the most. Why? Because her heart was completely yielded to him. Tonight, my prayer for you, this invitation is this. Fully yield your heart to him. Whatever you're holding back, I don't have any idea what it is. Give it to him. Whatever I'm holding back, give it to him. Give it to him. 
and let nothing be your own. I don't have a bank account. I don't have property. I don't have any. All of this belongs to my Heavenly Father. He's just given it to me so that I can be a steward over it. I'm reminded once again of what the Queen said. It's so touching. Oh, I hope I'm here when Jesus comes back again. And her chaplain asked her, Your Majesty, why do you want to see the, the Lord's return so bad? With tears running down her face, she said, because I want to lay my crown at his feet. Oh, that we would lay our, the crowns of our life at the feet of Jesus. Amen. That's what we do. And when that happens, revival springs up in our hearts. I don't know that your church will grow, but it'll be revived. You'll be filled up. You'll be joyous. And God will pour his richest blessings upon you. If you're here tonight and you have something that you're holding back, I encourage you tonight, let go of it. Say, God, I've held all this. It's yours now. You might not even know. Lord, help me. Reveal to me those things that I need to turn loose to you. Remember, we're in a walk. We're in a faith walk. He'll show you. If you ask him, he'll show you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you tonight for the blessing of this church. I thank you for her pastor. I thank you for these that sing, that lead, the deacons here. I thank you for everything about this church. Lord, what a lovely group of people it is. But God, we come before you tonight to surrender all. Just as these ladies sang, I surrender all. God, I want you just to engulf me and hold me and use me and let me hold nothing back from you. God, that it may be said of me, he loved God with all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his mind. Lord, speak to us now. Convict us, lead us, guide us, draw us, forgive us. Or we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.